So my name is Gregor Veble. I am head of research at Pipister, company producer of light aircraft. And I will be talking about the design process in our company, namely the design process from the idea to actually making a complete aeroplane. And I will talk about the complexity of such a process because it involves a group of engineers and other people uh, that are required to really execute a successful design. So whether you're a designer, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a marketing person, uh, you should be able to get a glimpse of what such a process entails and uh, from this uh, figure out uh, how, what your role in such a process might be. I mean, the lessons learned will be from aerospace industry. Uh, nevertheless, I think most of this can be applied to similar uh, industries such as automotive or yachting, uh, whichever uh, industry is related to aeroplanes in a technical way. Uh, this is the logo of our company where I work. Uh, as I said, I'm head of research there. I lead a department of about uh, 11 engineers plus five people working in the rapid prototyping department. But otherwise, I also give lectures at the University of Nova Gorica. I'm a physicist by education, so uh, I have a PhD in theoretical physics. But now, currently, I'm doing aerodynamic design mostly. What is uh, what are our main products. Uh, Pipistrel is right now a manufacturer of uh, light sport aircraft or ultra light aircraft, depending on the region or country you are living in. It falls under different regulations, but these are called in the US, these are light sport aircraft. In Europe, these are ultra light aircraft. Uh, what I'm showing here is the Virus SW, which is our most sold product. We sell about 70 to 80 of these per year. And it is a high performance uh, ultra light uh, cruising airplane. The success of Pipister as a company started in the 90s when the ultralight category was mostly composed of airplanes made from cloth and uh, um, trusses. Uh, and Pipister came with glider technology, namely composite materials, mostly carbon fiber, glass fiber, or Kevlar, uh, in order to produce aircraft in the same segment, meaning very low weight, but really the performance jumped immensely mainly because of the clean designs that uh, are allowed by composite materials. Uh, we started with a slightly different model, but this was actually, uh, this is the evolution of the first model uh, that was built in Pipistrel using composite technology, and this is still by far the most sold aircraft from our range. What is interesting is that we further developed this aircraft into a glider, namely taking the wings and control surfaces from the Sinos aircraft, but mated it to a side-by-side -side glider fuselage. So Taurus is an evolution of the Sinos design, but where the engine itself, as you can see, can be uh, extracted or stowed away uh, in flight even, uh, so that you can use the engine for climbing and then you can go soaring or gliding uh, whenever you desire. Or if you lose altitude, you can again extend the engine, climb and continue soaring. What I am showing here is, uh, in this corner, top right, uh, is the first electric two-seater aircraft in the world even. So we built the first electric aircraft, the two-seater, you can see the prototype top right. And this is also on the market, it was the first two-seater electric aircraft on the market. Right now you can get a couple of others, but this was the pioneering result in 2007. However, both of these designs uh, were completed before my time at Pipister. I joined in 2007. What I will be talking about mostly now is uh, two aircraft. Namely, the first one is the Taurus G4. Does anybody know this aircraft? Has anybody seen it? Raise your hands. Okay. One person. Um, this is a very particular design, as you can see. It's a twin fuselage design. Uh, essentially obtained by taking two of the aircraft, as you've seen before in the previous slide, and mating them with an extra wing, a special design wing in the middle, and putting the engine in the middle. And this design was really a single point design in the sense that it was designed for a very single particular purpose, namely competing in the so-called Green Flight Challenge sponsored by Google 2011. That's the official name. But this was a competition sponsored by NASA uh, to build uh, for... Uh, this was a competition between the world's most efficient aircraft. And I will be talking about this project, uh, mostly about this project, because uh, this is the first project that our uh, engineering team, which was started to be built in 2007, engineering and design team, actually followed from idea to complete execution. This is a closed project right now, so this will be, I will devote most time to this. Another aircraft that we designed uh, during the same time is the Pantera. 
Uh, again, a four-seater aircraft, high efficiency uh, aircraft, but a completely different plane. Namely, uh, this is a much more complex product, simply because this uh, has to appeal to customers. If the previous aircraft was a competition aircraft, uh, this aircraft has to appeal to customers, and this uh, increases the complexity of design quite a bit. Namely, uh, this took about five to six times more time to develop than the previous design. Uh, and we will return to it. So this is, uh, this is the first uh, exit of our company from the ultralight or light sport aircraft market into the fully certified um, private pilot uh, territory. Namely, this is a general aviation aircraft, four-seat aircraft, designed for high aerodynamic efficiency and also designed to appeal. And I will focus, in the end, I will focus also on this design, but this uh, aircraft didn't even fly yet. This is just the prototype built, but right now it is in the uh, structural testing phase. Uh, we expect the first flights to begin later this year. The design is finished, the aircraft is finished, but we still didn't fly it. Okay, this is a design cliche, all the designers. This is such a cliche that I will not even go into it, but it's attributed to Louis Sullivan, a modernist architect, uh, who says that form should follow function and not vice versa. So whenever you design a pro pro product or a building or whatever, uh, the form should follow uh, whatever the purpose of the object is. And this is according to Wikipedia, if you can trust random strangers editing things, then this is true. What was interesting is that in the same, on the same page, you can find the following uh, sentence, namely that modernists believed, perhaps incorrectly, that airplane design did not involve any aesthetic decisions by the airplane designers. So airplane design at that time, in modernist time, was considered as the most pure form of design because the aircraft is designed just to perform its function and its form follows from that function. So aircraft design is interesting from that point of view. However, what is aircraft design? What are we talking about here? Is it the styling of the aircraft? Is it the engineering of the aircraft? Uh, this is something I want to give you a glimpse into. So, what, what does it mean to design an aircraft? However, this will be mostly an engineer's view. I am an engineer, actually, scientist, engineer, so uh, I will be coming mostly from this perspective. However, uh, we do a lot of work with designers, uh, and uh, I have a, quite a good grasp on all the aspects of such a design, so hopefully. It will be a complete picture. So this is a, a picture of one very famous aircraft designer. Unfortunately, he worked mostly in the military field, so his designs were, let's say, not so good from the ethical point of view. But they were very successful structurally, aerodynamically. So they were, he developed quite a few uh, very important uh, platforms in, during his time. So this is Clarence Kelly Johnson, the leader of uh, Skunk Works at Lockheed. Uh, company, so some of you might recognize it's the designs. Top left is the U-2 aircraft, which was shot down over the Soviet Union. Top right is the, still the fastest jet aircraft in the world, namely the SR-71 spy plane. And then you have the Starfighter and the uh, uh, Lockheed Lightning from the Second World War. And these are the designs that he supervised. However, he was not a designer by trade. I'm not even sure if the function of a designer existed at the, at the time when he was uh, entering his studies, namely he was a mechanical engineer of course, but clearly a genius that could uh, bring together a lot of people uh, to work on a single idea and to pull, out, pull off a successful design. But right now aircraft, aircraft is an industry just like any other, so let's consider it from the point of view of industrial design, how to view it from the point of industrial design and compare it to similar industries. So, Clearly, in aircraft design, emphasis is on functionality. Obviously, we want the aircraft to fly well. Uh, styling is usually just a secondary consideration. What I'm giving below is two aircraft that were designed in roughly the same era. Uh, two products that were designed roughly in the same era. On the left is the Mooney aircraft, and on the right is one of the Ferrari models. So, what would you consider the biggest difference between the two designs in terms of styling? Any clues? So what, what's the impression of the thing on the left and the thing on the right? Who's a designer here? Industrial designer studying industrial design? Okay, give, give, give us your comments then. 
Yeah, but it's not fair because I know what you do with the... No, it doesn't matter. You just, <coughs> just comment on what you think the uh, shape represents, etc. I mean, I, I don't really understand your... I mean, what, what is your uh, expectation in this question? No expectation, just your answer. <laughs> Well, right. for me, the, let's say, the form follow the, the function, then it's, it's something else, or they, they choose some, let's say, they choose the design in front of the technology choice. For example, the, the Ferrari has the engine, if I'm right, on the, at the rear. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this this money is also quite uh, good efficient. Uh, it was in this his time <laughs> quite efficient plane, uh, and his design quite fine. So, mm -hmm. so yes. And then yeah, technical part was shaping the main the main the main form, let's say. And after I don't know, we, we can discuss about this graphism, mm -hmm. red and white. Uh, Okay, good. No, I'm not so interested in the actual uh, graphical design, although on the right it's quite important. But the point is really that both of these uh, products represent, let's, let's say, the pinnacle of the era when they were designed. So the Muni is still probably the fastest piston aircraft in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but, what, but that's exactly the point I was getting to. This was 30 years ago, but if you look at the market now, you will see essentially the same aircraft still being sold at, uh, as being the best aircraft in the market. Whereas nobody could sell the thing on the right anymore unless you are looking into uh, old cars. But as a new car, of course, this shape would not work. So that's, yeah. that, that's the main thing yeah, I was getting. The market is completely different. Yes, absolutely. But it's changing. So that's the point, yeah. really. Right now, the market was completely different. So everybody really required complete functionality from aircraft. But right now, the market is changing. Aircraft are becoming, again, more and more lifestyle uh, equipment. So uh, the market is also shifting and we have to follow this. That's the idea. So what is aircraft design then? How to approach it? So I put this slide that we can split it horizontally. So in order to build an aircraft, you actually need a lot of uh, disciplines, different disciplines to be able to pull off a successful design and like, you have to be able to work in unison in all these disciplines. Clearly there is aer aerodynamics necessary because the external shape of the aircraft is directly what determines how the aircraft will fly, how it will perform, how it will uh, handle, how the handling qualities will be. And aerodynamics is clearly a very important part, but maybe not even the most important. Structural design is just as much, if not, if not even more important, because if you cannot support the loads experienced by the aircraft uh, properly, so that the aircraft breaks in mid-flight, this is of course um, not desired. But if you build the aircraft too strong, namely if you are very conservative in terms of uh, structural design, you will create an aircraft that is too heavy. And weight is the killer for aircraft performance. So structural design optimization of structures is just as important as, as uh, aerodynamic optimization. And then you need experts from propulsion technology. Right now electric aircraft are gaining uh, a lot of attention, but uh, piston engines, turbine engines are still the main uh, market uh, uh, still the main uh, engines in the market, so you need experts from propulsion, from controls, and do not forget the marketing aspect of any design. So if you cannot sell the aircraft, you just have to start uh, all over again. Like usually in aircraft design, each project is so expensive and takes such a long time that if you, if you do not have a clearly defined market and expectations for your design on the market, then you can really kill the company with a single project. So this is very common in uh, aircraft design. So, also for big companies like Boeing, so if they would fail with the Dreamliner right now, which didn't get off to the best start, but it's a successful design, uh, you can quickly bury the company with a single wrong project. So this is the, all the knowledge that you require. But how do you apply this knowledge? What I'm following now here is just uh, standard textbooks. There actually exist textbooks on aircraft design. And typically, the process is split into stages. So you start at the top with the idea, and then you size the aircraft. So this is the first step. First you figure out, based on very simplified models, on how the aircraft would perform, if it had such a wing, and if it had, if it had such a long fuselage, etc., etc. 
you estimate how the aircraft will perform and then iterate the shape of the aircraft, the general shape, the layout. This, this is on the level of how big the wing will be, how large the wingspan will be, how long the fuselage will be. Uh, then you estimate the weights, etc. And then you sort of get an idea of how big the aircraft will be and all of its surfaces. However, even at this stage, you need input from all the, uh, all the disciplines I mentioned. Namely, aerodynamics will tell you how big the wind must be to carry such a structure. The structural engineer will tell you how heavy the aircraft will be estimated uh, when you draw a shape, etc. etc. So, you already at the first stage, you need a complex team of people uh, working together uh, on the design from the very start. So, if you would listen just to your aerodynamicist, or just to your structural engineer, or just to your propulsion guy, you will just focus the design on some aspect and you might fail completely because it will uh, take all the aspects of the design in the beginning. After you are quite happy with the sizing, this is an example of the sizing of the aircraft, different sketches, you try different configuration, and this is a very quick process, so this can be done then for a small aircraft in a month or so. Then you go to preliminary design, where you take this general geometry of the aircraft and you actually start building proper surfaces for it. Namely, you will set the aerodynamics for the aircraft, choose the wing sections, choose the basically design the general shape, but just have uh, and the general structural concept of the aircraft, but you do not go to the finest details like every bolt and every screw, etc. This is something left for the last stage, detailed design. So in the sizing stage you have a couple of engineers working, then in the preliminary design the team expands and then when you go to detailed design, where you go, for example, this is an example of an engine mount where you have to have all the mounting points, etc. This is where you need, in the end, the biggest thing. And when you get to the detailed design phase, you better be sure that the preliminary design will work as expected because going backwards to revise the design at this stage is very, very expensive and time consuming. But it happens, so you do revise design, so you just have to be careful not to do it too often. Uh, here I'm showing some study of what I do, really. So uh, sometimes we just take over only parts of the design. So I will just tell you how complex the design will be and how different um, fields, namely in this point it was marketing versus uh, aerodynamicist, uh, can uh, work on a problem. This was a project that was given to us by an Italian company who designed this general shape, as you can see here, it's a canard aircraft, meaning that the elevator is on the front surface, for those of you who like aircraft, and that the wing is in the back. Not a very good configuration if you ask me, but the marketing likes it, so they said, okay, but we like lift, uh, they said. We like about 50% lift of what we need for the aircraft to uh, perform the minimum flight speed. And of course, we would say, well, that's because it chooses a canard design, but let's say marketing said, okay, you have to work with this. Uh, their, their marketing department, not ours. Um, and they said, okay, you can work on the external shape, but do not change the aesthetics. So how can you do that, right? I mean, how can you work on the shape, but not change the aesthetics? And sometimes in aerodynamics, you can do just minor things, minor details that uh, can help. Uh, the top is their original design, the bottom is our optimization of the design. And we gained about 50% of lift. Uh, with the bottom. And it's quite hard to distinguish any differences between top and bottom. What we did was change all the airfoils, uh, redesign the front flap, but the general aesthetics of the aircraft remains the same. Okay, we did have to increase the wing in the end by 10%, but still we gained 50% lift with just minor changes. So you have to play between two aspects sometimes to optimize the design, and then you can get both teams happy just as long as you listen to each other very well. And you can really optimize the design in different ways, not just in a single, single direction. But this is very important, you have to communicate well and uh, ask really what is required and not set hard constraints uh, for designs when there is none. So this is how I view the design process. Design is not engineering, design is not styling, design is not research or whatever. Design is a process really of taking all of these aspects together and coming up with a product. This of course doesn't apply just to aircraft, but this is where I was coming from. But really to follow a successful design, it's not so much about being a good stylist or being a good engineer, but really about, about getting people to work together, especially on complex products, to bring all the aspects together in a unified way, such that everybody is in the end happy, but most importantly that the customer is happy in the end. <coughs> Okay, 
this was, let's say, an introduction as to how we perceive the design process for aircraft. Hopefully, you get a glimpse and it probably applies to a lot of other industries, but this is just really our philosophy. What I will talk about now is the Green Flight Challenge and the Taurus G4 aircraft, this strange uh, two fuselage thing that I showed you before, uh, and uh, talk to you about this project from the general idea all the way to the competition itself. So we will see a complete project, how it, how it was handled and how it was successfully handled, actually. So. Green Flight Challenge was a competition. Uh, Prizes were provided by NASA, the American Space Agency. Uh, Google was the sponsor of the organization of the competition. And it was, there are the requirements. I just made a small excerpt of the requirements for the aircraft. Okay, who hates imperial units? I do. Uh, this, is, uh, this is better. So, uh, in uh, more common units, these were the requirements. Okay, the booklet was about 50 pages thick of the regulations, but these were really the requirements which uh, fixed our design, let's say at least at the sizing stage. And then later on we had to, of course, take other aspects into account. But these are really the constraints for the aircraft. Namely, the aircraft had to spend less than 1.17 liters per 100 kilometers per passenger. So if you had four passengers, then you could spend four liters of fuel or not fuel, but energy equivalent of regular gasoline. So clearly, because of the energy conversion uh, efficiency, electric aircraft will be favored in this competition. If you can get an energy efficiency conversion of about 40% for a piston engine, uh, electrical energy conversion from batteries to uh, propeller is about uh, 92% in our case. So there is a clear difference. However, the aircraft had to, to have this efficiency at speeds over 160 km per hour, so this was no easy task. And at the same time be able to cover more than 300 km of range, with half an hour reserve energy left on board after landing. Furthermore, the minimum speed had to be below 83 km per hour, another very critical issue. And the takeoff distance had to be less than 600 meters. And at the same time, this was further, I mean, this was mostly on the front page. But then later, if you go through the regulations, when you see what the course was like in the competition, you realize that you had to climb to the first waypoint, which was 24 kilometers away from the airport at the height of 1,200 meters. So you required a certain climb rate to be able to reach this altitude uh, quickly enough. So the competition itself was originally scheduled for July 2011 and was comprised of two flights. Namely, you had uh, two days of flying. One, uh, on one flight you had to fly with the pos maximum possible efficiency of your aircraft and on the second day you had to fly at the maximum possible speed that your aircraft could reach. However, there were hard constraints. So both, uh, during both flights you had to fulfill all of the requirements as I said before. So namely, your efficiency had to be good enough and you had to be faster than 160 kilometers per hour. And furthermore, the competition stated that you were not allowed to change battery packs on your aircraft. If you had an electric aircraft, the battery configuration was frozen at the moment you took off for the first flight. So on the second flight, you had to have the same battery configuration. And these are the requirements that really limit you. Uh, what is the problem that you face the battery configuration? Well, for those of you who work with batteries or who know how batteries work, what's the biggest problem with batteries for aircraft? Okay. Oh, sorry, okay. they are very, very heavy. Yes. So uh, if you have to, if you want to fly fast, then you will, of course, burn more energy. So if you want to fly really fast, you need more and more uh, batteries. Clearly. However, if you want to fly efficiently, efficiently, you need a little weight. So then you have to reduce the amount of batteries. So then you have to have a compromise on how many batteries you put into the aircraft to get the best result. And then the total score was taken from two flights, and if you take imperial units, there is the formula. So speed is in miles per hour, mileage is in passenger miles per gallon, and then you get some result from both flights. Okay, so what do we do? We wanted to compete in this competition, but uh, there was simply, when the competition uh, regulations were published, there was simply no aircraft that would fulfill them. It simply didn't exist. So we said, okay, we have to design something new. And we started, of course, with the two-seater aircraft, this is what we had, and then did a concept study. However, the problem was uh, we wanted to have an efficient aircraft, so it had to have a retractable undercarriage, and only the Taurus aircraft, the glider from our range, has a retractable undercarriage. And uh, 
the problem was where to put the engine. If the engine was put on the mast, as you've seen before, then you get uh, such a forward pitching moment that uh, you, whatever efficiency you gain in putting the, air, the engine away, you lose because you have to trim the aircraft. You have to pull really hard back on this thing to keep level flight. So that was really not such a good idea. So we were looking whether we can put it on the nose or whatever. And then the colleague of ours who actually was the, uh, then the project leader for this uh, said, why don't we take two fuselages? I mean, the regulations say that you, can, you have to have consumption good only per passenger, not total consumption. So we can build a bigger aircraft and still reach a similar result. However, then there is no such an issue with placing the engine anymore. So if you take two fuselages, separate them, put an extra wing in the middle, then you can put also the engine there in the middle, propeller, and you have a good concept. So when we first saw the sketch, we said it's stupid, I mean, why would you build such an aircraft? But then the more you think about the idea, the more sense it made. And in the end we realized, in this way we can use a lot of standard components, namely the fuselage is standard, the tail is standard, the ex external wing is standard. What we had to design was the thing in the middle between the two uh, fuselages. And then there was the question, of course, if the, all of these parts are standard, how far apart to put the uh, fuselages? So, of course, if you put the fuselages further apart, this increases your flight efficiency. However, it decreases your handling uh, qualities of the aircraft. So, how the aircraft behaves when you roll it or when you roll it. Uh, and uh, there was the compromise between these two aspects. So, our boss said you should not separate the fuselages by more than four meters. So we separated it by five and never told him about it. So <laughs> easy solution. Um, because we wanted to go further forward and it was actually the final design, and you will see that it gave us problems. Namely, um, this section is much, uh, it's, well, it's the depth of the section, but really it's much thicker than this part, let's call it thickness, for those of you who are not in aeronautics. And if you have such a distribution of uh, surfaces, then it gives you some problems in when generating high lift, and you will see these issues occur and how we successfully solved them in the uh, I mean, the total, what I forgot to tell you is that the total area of the wing is fixed. Namely, because for a certain amount of lift to fly at a low speed, you need a certain area uh, of the wing. So if you want to bring the two fuselages together, then you have to increase the, uh, this um, chord of this uh, wing, uh, so that the total area remains the same. So you can see, either you make such a configuration or you make such a configuration. In the end, we had a compromise as usual. So in December 2010, and remember Ju July 2011 was the competition schedule, we finalized the sizing of the aircraft. So this was the sizing process. So how big the central wing section would be, estimated the weights, uh, and did the uh, structural concept. What is really important in such a twin fuselage design is that structurally such a design is much lighter than if you had a single big fuselage at the center, and uh, had a very long wing. Because if you have a very long wing, if you had the fuselage in the center and the very long wing, you would have a lot of uh, bending moment in the center. So to handle this bending moment, you need a very massive structure at that point to uh, carry these loads. But if you distribute the loads even more evenly across the span, then the structure, structural weight of the aircraft goes down. And this was one of the key reasons why we were successful in the competition with such a design. Uh, we estimated the maximum takeoff mass to be 1,500 kilos, and in the end, it turned out that when we built the aircraft and put it all together, together with the passengers, the competition mass was almost spot on. And then there is the splitting of the weights that were uh, uh, split between different parts of the aircraft. I mean, the empty aircraft weight, if you take the batteries out, if you consider them as fuel, was 632 kilos. This was including the engine. Uh, and all the structure, but without pilots and batteries. And there was almost exactly half a ton of batteries on board, so one third of the weight was just the batteries. And there were then four standard passengers on board. So the aircraft never flew with four passengers, but you had to carry ballast instead of the passengers uh, if you didn't carry four. <coughs> what is interesting is also the power requirements. Cruise power for the competition was estimated to be 32 kilowatts necessary. And this is a fairly small engine. However, if you wanted to take off in 600 meters, you needed at least 120 kilowatts of power. So even though you would require a much smaller engine to be the most efficient, uh, you need a big engine to take off in the 600 meters required. And furthermore, the engine required a continuous power of 85 kilowatts just to climb to the first waypoint. 
the lift to drag ratio or the uh, finesse of the aircraft was about 30 and the energy capacity, total energy capacity of all the batteries was 100 uh, kilowatt hours. And this is the work I did then, I will, I will show you more about uh, my aspects which I know best. I, mean, I, I was in charge of designing the aerodynamics for the aircraft, so design all the external surfaces that were new, design the new propeller. Uh, and work with a team of engineers from structures and from uh, electrical parts, so electrical propulsion, just to get everything right, sized correctly. So I did the sizing first, which you said, uh, determining all the surfaces, the sizes of the surfaces, and actually designing all the surfaces in the end. So what we had to do is design first the central wing. This was the most important part, this big slab. So we, we, I designed a special airfoil for this aircraft, a low moment airfoil so that we reduce trimming drag for those of you who are um, into aircraft. And an airfoil which has uh, quite a lot of laminar flow. So on the bottom side up to this point approximately, and on the top side up to this point. Laminar airflow means that there is much less drag than you could have if the flow is turbulent. What I mean by laminar and turbulent flow, for those of you who are not familiar with fluid dynamics, when the air passes near the surface, uh, it first passes, let's say, cleanly, but at some point, due to instability in the air, it starts to get vortices in it, and this is causing drag. Really. So you want to design your surfaces such that you have as much clean flow around it and as little turbulent flow as possible. And then we designed the slotted flap for the central wing section, so we used computational fluid dynamics tools just from the very start. So just when you are still designing the aircraft, you can use uh, computer tools just to design uh, uh, certain um, aerodynamic devices that help you then uh, optimize the design even further. And we designed a special slot in this area which helps with the airflow. And the CL max was estimated to be 2.6 and in flights it actually was proven to be the case. One of the key co uh, causes of drag is not just turbulent flow or uh, skin friction, but also uh, the mixing of air because of lift generation. So any aircraft that generates lift also generates drag because it creates these vortices in the flow. So all of these vortices carry energy, so when you create lift you also create the drag, and this is called the lift-induced drag. However, to, to have as little induced drag as possible, you need to have the lift distributed in a very uniform way along the span of the aircraft. So each section of the wing should carry roughly the same uh, amount of lift, except for the tips. So, okay, the ideal distribution is elliptical, but let's say in this area where we're looking, where we are most interested in this transition, the lift distribution should be as uniform as possible. However, the surface distribution in such a design, which is a compromise, is not uniform, right? So you see, this is a much thicker surface than this one. And then we had to somehow figure out how to match the lift of these two sections so that uh, we would not stir the air too much. And our suggestion was, and our, our implementation was that all of these wings have some trailing edge devices, flaps, so-called. So by deflecting the flap on the outboard wing, uh, what I'm showing here is the lift distribution. Uh, blue is the central wing, and uh, red and purple are the outward wings for two different flap settings. And this is the angle of attack, so how the wing is coming onto the airflow. And by changing the flap angle here, you can match the lift distribution at a certain angle of attack, or if you deflap the flap further, you can match the lift distribution at another angle of attack. So that way, even if we have a compromised design in terms of surface distribution, we can still tailor the aerodynamics such that the efficiency of the aircraft is uh, good. And here you can see the span efficient, the efficiency of such an approach, namely this is one is the theoretical best efficiency of such a this of any wing of certain span. And by changing the flaps you can flap setting you can get ideal efficiency at different angles of attack just by deflecting flaps differently. So this was a very it's not a new idea but it was implemented successfully. And then I did some propeller design. Again, you take comp I developed some computer tools just to design propellers. It's called, called the lifting line theory for those of you in aerodynamics. And it's a, it's a theory which allows you to calculate the power demands and thrust of propellers. And what we did was uh, create computer programs which automatically optimize the shape of the propeller. Where you can just say, okay, I want this sort of power on my propeller and I want the best thrust for it. And at this speed, I want that power. So I had a three-point design for the propeller. And 
this is a result of computer optimization. So this is what the computer said is the ideal shape in the end. So this is the shape of the propeller. We, we went deliberately for a fixed pitch propeller. Some propellers, you can change the angle. We went for a fixed pitch propeller simply because it's a simple thing to build. One less system to care, care about in making the aircraft more reliable. We had a very limited time frame, so we wanted to make a simpler design as possible. And how was the propeller designed? Okay, I told my computer program, this is the map of the electric motor, of the best efficiency of the electric motor. Here is the speed in revolutions per minute, here is the power in kilowatts, and what is uh, isocurves show is the, is the efficiency isocurves. So this is the island of the best efficiency for the engine, and you want to, your propeller to be spinning at such a speed that you are always as close to po as possible to this best efficiency area. So this point here represents in, in the final design the takeoff point for the propeller, this is the climb point, and this is the cruise point. And when I told the computer, okay, work with this, and this is the result that was out, and it's, it's quite a nice shape to look at the two, so people, a lot of people admire it. So sometimes you get very interesting designs just from, let's say, some mathematical procedure, and then in the end, it looks almost something that has like a work of art. We again did some further CFD analysis of the total shape where I first drew the, the what is shown here is the main wing and this is the engine column or the nacelle. And we just, the first iteration was of course take all the components and put as small a shape as possible around them just to create the least drag. But when we put it into the CFD codes, we were very surprised to get flow separation here in the area of, of uh, trailing edge of the wing. So then, just by using a very simple iteration, this took no, less, no more than an hour uh, to change the shape, to be, namely just the bulge, the uh, area. It's just a bit, but not too much, not to increase the surface area too much, then you can get nice clean airflow. And this is all done in the, still in the preliminary design stage. So this is not in flight testing where you don't even have to go into a wind tunnel right now with, uh, uh, when you have CFD analysis. Of course, it would be good to have wind tunnel analysis, but not in the time frame that we had for the project. The design was, external shape was frozen by this point and then we went into building the first pieces. What was interesting is that uh, this design was not completed uh, totally before going into production. So we just defined the external shape and the basic structure and then we started building components and the controls were then designed on top of that, etc, etc. So there was still design going on uh, while prototyping was already taking place just because of time constraints. So these are now the first parts being built. This is the closing grip of the central wing section. You will see these components later on. So this is now just uh, some composite work. So we are building it from carbon fiber. These are the two fuselages which are standard. And this is then the main spar of the central wing, for example, also made of carbon. And this is already the bottom part of the wing here in a mold, also made from carbon uh, or carbon fiber. This carbon is short and for carbon fibers uh, reinforced. Uh, graphite epoxy, or there are different names. Um, this is the spar again. These are the ribs that were shown as the first part. Bottom part of the wing, and now the top part of the mold is coming on top, and then you glue it all together with epoxy, and then you have a very solid piece, like this. You can already see the control linkage is also, this was very important because you have a twisted <coughs> design, all the controls from one side of the airplane have to be carried onto the other side, uh, so these are the control linkages then from one fuselage to another. What we also have here is on the top is a provision for the ballistic parachute, the requirement of the competition was that the aircraft had to have a ballistic parachute, which allows the whole aircraft to be rescued in case of emergency, so you fire the parachute and the whole aircraft then descends with this parachute, so we had to have provisions for uh, um, what are they called? Uh, uh, the strips of uh, Kevlar, to, which carry the uh, structure in the end. So on 2nd of, uh, of March, the aircraft started to take shape. So this was starting to be built. This is the nacelle I was showing you. This is this area which was then, you can see, bulged the part of it, just optimized. Uh, Central wing, fuselage. And the problem was that we almost didn't, wasn't, didn't fit into our prototyping department. So we had to go diagonally. On the 26th of March, we got the batteries delivered. So we ordered them. So this, so this was a very tight project. 
And then we immediately started to make better effects. You can see we sealed it off very nicely because there is a lot of energy density in here. So if you make a short cut, you will just burn the whole factory. So uh, <laughs> this is dangerous stuff. So uh, it didn't help that this was also the time when in Idochino, where I live, uh, we have Bora winds, strong Bora winds, and we were doing this during the time when there was about 200 kilometers per hour wind outside. So the whole building was shaking. So they didn't help either. Uh, and you see these battery packs now being uh, put onto the aircraft. We had three battery packs and we distributed them, uh, one in each fuselage and one in the center of the cell, and this distributes the weight as evenly as possible across the span, uh, and this gives the aircraft the efficiency because the structure can be lighter. So this is one such battery pack of nine batteries, and in the front this is the engine mount and the engine itself. Uh, this is the testing of the engine mount. Uh, this was also optimized. The engine mount was optimized before being built using finite element methods to uh, analyze the structure. So we really sized the thickness and uh, diameter of the, all the tubes to get the uh, right structural uh, requirements. So we followed all the standard testing procedures for aircraft. Uh, and when we presented this optimized design to our uh, te uh, technical guys who actually built it, they said this when they were carrying the loads, but then we did all the tests and it was doing just fine, so uh, it was really interesting. I mean, this was really a confirmation that these design methods work, namely that you can, on the computer, already estimate all the loads, uh, with a certain, of course, margin of safety, because a computer model is never good enough, but for this purpose it worked just perfectly. And then on 30th of March, this is interesting, we also didn't test just the um, engine mount, of course, but the whole wing was not tested structurally. This is the most important structural member of the aircraft, the whole wing assembly. So you have the central wing, and to each side you have the external wings as well. And you will see now how we proceeded. So now you see the central wing here, and then the external wing outward. And then we put all concrete, nothing, nothing particularly sophisticated, just you have to get the loads. Right, so you will see now how much it bends without breaking. But this you have to do for each aircraft so to, to fly safely. And if it doesn't work, if it something breaks, then you have to redesign everything. Of course, if something broke here, we would stop the project because there was no time. So on 4th of May, we thought we'll go flying. So this is not a completed prototype. So we'll think about it in December was the idea. Uh, in May, we are, uh, 4th of May, we are on the airport here in Slovenia, getting ready for the short flight. We need some high speed taxi tests. Maybe this is some. Okay, that's just crickets, so let's start again. <laughs> this is just the propeller sound. The propeller is actually quite loud, just because it's a fixed pitch propeller and it's uh, not ideally suited for a, a very slow speeds, but this was never the design point, so this way we get quite a bit of a loud design. We did manage to make a one half a takeoff just on one side, and it was a hop because of a gust of wind, but then we had some electronics issues, so with software in the end, so with battery management system, so the, just the cold system shut down at some point and we didn't abort all the testing, and then it was now time was running out, so we just shipped the aircraft to the US. Luckily, none of the other competitors were really any more successful than we were, so the whole competition was postponed until September. <laughs> so this was good. <laughs> we shipped the aircraft there, we tested, but uh, before flying the competition, we had to have really a full flight test done, so 40 hours of flying. So on 4th of August, we finally received the improved uh, battery management systems, and then we installed it. This was in Oshkosh. And some nice aircraft also sharing the hangar. So Jure, who was our main electronics guy, then vigorously replaced all the systems, reprogrammed them. Uh, this is our test pilot, Dave Morse, who they met actually. They, we didn't have a test pilot, so he approached us in Oshkosh, which is the biggest event for general aviation in the US, and says, I want to fly this plane. He's a professional test pilot. When he saw how weird it is, he said, I have to fly this. <laughs> so we were, okay, sure, why not? <laughs> And then on 12th of August, uh, it was the first successful flight, and uh, 
absolutely no technical issues after the first flight. We, we could not believe it. It was such a strange aircraft, and after the first flight, we had some, quite a few issues before uh, the first flight with electronics. But after the first flight, it worked just like, you know, you wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it, it would work so well after, if somebody told me it should. And then we immediately proceeded to um, flight testing evaluation. So for those of you in aircraft design, we are not testing the stability of the aircraft with respect to the uh, long period oscillation of the fluid mode. Uh, you will see it's slightly unstable, but this is something the pilot can compensate for. It's not something very you would put in a regular aircraft to be so unstable, but for an experimental competition aircraft, that was okay. So. Of course, we had to test for uh, whether this works or not, right? I mean, this, in full flight testing, then we can test whether this idea really worked or not. So I put some tufts on the airplane, put the camera here, and then we checked whether the flow kit is regular or not. Which was a good thing that we did this. Uh, the flow was quite regular here, but what happened was that this was structurally very light, and the whole thing from the pressure coming from the cooling just bulged apart. So what you can see here is actually some airflow exiting to the sides. So this part was okay, but there was airflow from the reserve going outwards. And this is something we fixed. We wouldn't see it. I mean, you don't see it from the aircraft itself, but with the camera we saw it and we fixed this issue, which was causing quite a lot of drag. And then we had some problems with minimum speed, of course. Uh, what happens is, uh, when you fly very slowly, that central section, especially with this flap which we designed, which carried a lot of lift, uh, causes a lot of these uh, vortices. Then you have two vortices around the fuselage itself. So what was happening is that there is the local airflow is not like uh, coming straight at the wing, but because of the central wing is creating a lot of lift, the local airflow here is going upwards. This is the graph of how much it's going upwards along the span. So this is the part of the fuselage, and on the outward span you have a lot of up. Uh, upflow on this part of the wing, and what is happening is that this part of the wing is not generating any, any lift anymore, it's stalled, and we installed some vortex gen micro vortex generators to correct for this, and it also worked brilliantly, but it causes a bit of drag. However, minimum flight speed was something we had to do, and we tried this, and then we removed them until we reached the proper minimum flight speed before stalling. So this is now the corrections in the design, which you can get from the evaluation of the design. I also did have to do some flight, you cannot see it there, it's a nice picture I like because we did some flight tests and it was quite enjoyable. Here is a landing. This is a very efficient aircraft, so we had to make it very inefficient for landing somehow. But we removed the air brakes or the spoilers which, because they carry weight. We did some different design, namely for landing, we, create, we put the center flap down and outward flaps up. This is very standard for the competition uh, remote control gliders. Uh, but not on such a huge scale aircraft, but it worked perfectly, so the landing was completely normal. Uh, what is really interesting though is that the pilots, the, any pilot that flew it for the first time aligned the aircraft wrongly, because you do not align it on the center line, you have to align it slightly to the right. <laughs> of course. So you can see the touchdown soon, in a few seconds. The left fuselage already touched down, and the right fuselage touches down, so flying like this. And now there is a thrust reversal. This is nice, the electric motor you can run in reverse and you can stop much more quickly this way without using the brakes. So they pilot engage the thrust reversal. This is what the aircraft looks like from the ground. It's really weird, uh, uh, in sort of a space shuttle kind of way. And on 24th of September the competition began. So there were 12 entrants to the competition. Only four teams managed to build the aircraft in the time. So uh, it was, I mean, after what we saw uh, happen, uh, I mean, in the process, it was very clear to us that not a lot of people will manage, especially with the electric aircraft. This was really pioneering work in the field of electric aircraft, and um, only a few teams managed. And from these teams, only two were actually electric planes. So one was the e-genius from the University of Stuttgart, with the engine mount at the top, so, which is not very good from trim drag point of view, and it was us. Uh, do you notice any similarity between the aircraft? Yeah, it's the same community. It's the same fuselage, in, indeed. Uh, this was, we had a project with the University of Stuttgart years ago uh, for building the um, 
first, uh, um, how do you call it, fuel cell uh, electric aircraft, so hydrogen fuel cell electric aircraft uh, using hydrogen as fuel. However, Daimler didn't produce the fuel cell for this project, so it was abandoned. But then this decision returned to us as a boomerang because then the University of Stuttgart converted the aircraft to electric flight and then there were our most serious competitors at the competition. But it was good, otherwise there would be really no proper competition if they didn't arrive. <laughs> <laughs> that was okay. It, 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 was, it was a nice sporting event. It, we had a lot of fun together, so it was, it was cool. Uh, and this would, would have been very similar to a two-seater design that we would produce anyway. So uh, it was interesting to see how the two concepts uh, actually compare. So the way the process started, so this was all meticulously, the rule book was followed, so they went to check everything uh, on the aircraft. And then takeoff begins, so these are some photos. This is the takeoff. <laughs> and then during the competition, we were just looking at the aircraft passing. They did four circles around above the air airport at about 1,000 meters. So this is one of the photos from that time. You can see the circuit here, so and also the consistency of our pilots just following the racetrack. And then the finish, okay, the aircraft is here, it's quite high up, it's the finish line. And you can see the aircraft not during these flights on takeoff. The music is awful, but it's not our video. Uh, but it's still, uh, And you can see the right hand fuselage going in quickly, but the left hand side and fuselage undercarriage going quickly, but the left hand side is going much more slowly because the right hand side is manually operated, left is electric, of course, because you cannot reach it. So, but you can see also how small the aircraft is when you look at it from the back, so the aerodynamic efficiency comes from this. So it's quite a big thing, but look from front or back, it's almost invisible. Now on landing, note how the aircraft bounces and then just rolls along one side of the fuselage. This was a characteristic of one of our pilots who always landed on the left fuselage. The other one was okay. Bounce and then rolling and then finally finish it. And these are our pilots after the competition. <laughs> As you notice, the company logo, our company logo is a bat. <laughs> so we had twin bats. And why they were actually given this shirt is because the main pilot was Dave Morris, but the co pilot was Robin Reed, so it was clearly the day after Batman and Robin. <laughs> and so we built a, a twin bat for them, so twin fuselage design. And this is the the whole team really, uh, the design and uh, the aircraft more or less, and then also running the competition plus the two pilots. There is myself and a bit planning the main structure and engineer Jack Langland was our advisor from the University of Pennsylvania who was actually the team leader because of the formalities. Our two pilots, Dave Robin, Jure is the electrics guy, Franz is the controls guy and my chief mechanic and Tina is the project leader and uh, systems guy. So that's really the design team. Uh, one guy is missing who was uh, left, who stayed in Slovenia. We did win the competition. So that's the, in the NASA Ames Center. The, this is the picture from there, the official one after winning $1.3 million, which about, was about 2.5 times as much as we spent on the project. So at least we got the money back. It was, wasn't so mad at us. Uh, what are the results? We actually did win in both categories. We were the best in efficiency. We were twice as good as was required in terms of energy conversion. If the mileage was required 200 passenger miles per gallon, we did 400. The next one was the Ingenious, of course, with 375. And the speed was also uh, the best from us, so 113 versus 107. Of course, the aircraft could go faster, but not on this battery pack. It's clear. So that's the fastest we could go. You cannot see the weights here, but this is the main differentiator between our aircraft and the e -Genius. The e -Genius weighed about 900 kilos for two passengers. We weighed 1,500 kilos for four passengers. So th that's where the, we can gain the most. Maybe about 70 kilos less per passenger. Mo mostly because of the twin design. So for a while we featured on the main NASA homepage, so it was quite nice. And, uh, 
This was also important for those of you in aviation. We were nominated for the Collier Trophy Award for 2011, which is the biggest award given in, uh, for achievement in aeronautics in the US. So we had space shuttle teams before, etc., as winners. And this year, the Boeing Dreamliner won, but we were a serious uh, entry. Of course, at the end, you want to know how well it performed the aircraft. So this is a very engineering part now. Uh, we did have a model of uh, our own for the aircraft. We didn't know how much exactly drag is uh, on the aircraft, what's the total drag of the airplane. So this was the only calibration parameter we had in the model. So then we just fitted this surface to the data points. What is shown here is on one axis, there is the required the power demand on the motor. Uh, here is the uh, speed of the aircraft and here is the vertical climb or descent speed. And this, if you do an aircraft model at a certain altitude, this falls on a single surface. Uh, the red points are the data, lo data log points from the competition flight, uh, speed competition flight, and the green is the efficiency competition flight data log points. And you can see that the model works quite well. What we were surprised though is that high speeds it's more efficient than we predicted. We had no idea why. We didn't fly the aircraft after the competition really properly to evaluate it, but we were not very far off uh, starting from the initial uh, design estimation to the final design. So the total lift to drag ratio and the competition speed, which was 160 kilometers power per kilometers per hour, is at its maximum. So the least drag for the lift created. So this, that's a good design then. Just the speed you require, it was slightly about 30 feet if you use this calibration. And this is an interesting result. Then we went, we used our model and said, okay, what if we use less batteries or more batteries for the competition? So what is the problem? If you use less batteries, what happens? You gain efficiency in the efficiency flight, but you lose speed in the speed competition. But on the other hand, if you put more batteries in, then you reduce efficiency, but you gain speed because you have more capacity. So the red point determines what's the minimum amount of batteries that would, with, with which we could fulfill the requirements, namely about 400 kilos. This is our actual battery mass, green, and you can see that whichever way we would deviate, we would not be better. So that is quite. We knew that we would be close, but in the end, when we calibrated everything from the data, we were quite surprised that we were so close to the optimum. So that's the aircraft, just to have a, more of an impression, just a few shots, uh, just to have an idea. Um, and so much for this project. So, do you have any questions about this project right now? What kind of motor do you, uh, do you use for, for this electric motor? Right, this is a standard of the shelf, really, motor slightly modified for our needs. Uh, it comes from the automotive industry, I mean, it's supplied mostly to the automotive industry, and it's 150 kilowatts uh, uh, instantaneous or 85 kilowatt uh, constant power motor. That's the Indian motor? Or? No, no, it's American. There is simply none uh, available in the market, uh, so really, just they, for this kind of aircraft, there simply was not a proper motor. I mean, otherwise, for all our other electric projects, we use Slovenian motors, uh, but for this competition, there was none available simply, or there was no time to develop it. Uh, why did you have to present yourself as an American company? Uh, that's the competition rules. They just wanted to, NASA was giving away taxpayer money, so it had to go to the U.S. Uh, things. Simple as that. And what about the batteries? Uh, is there any possibility to use another type? Because nowadays we have a lot of variety. Yes, absolutely. I mean, what we chose was the batteries that best suited our need. I mean, you can have batteries which discharge fast but have low capacity, or you can have batteries that discharge slowly but have very high capacity. What type of it was? This was lithium polymer, which is still by far the highest energy density you can get on the market right now. Of course, research shows different possibilities, but on the market, what is available and what is reliable is uh, this. Uh, we used uh, Kokan batteries, Korean ones, mm -hmm. and in the end, it turned out that they were really high energy density, um, about 200 uh, watt hours per kilo, which is uh, a lot for those people who are in this business. Still is quite, quite a benchmark. Mm -hmm. But the, the company actually did tailor made us the, as big uh, single battery cells as possible. We asked them for the biggest dimension which they could do and they delivered them for us mm -hmm. specifically. Where is the plane now? Uh, it's still in Hollister, California. 
uh, where we did fly testing and it's the local base of our test pilots. So right now it's still in the hangar. Uh, what we want plan is to find a good museum for it. So we'll see where it ends up. No, no more records or, or test or uh, developing. No, no, this aircraft, it's a, it's a finished project. I mean, it's, it's such a single point design and so useless for anything else apart from this competition that there is no point in developing it further. It's, uh, what, what we will develop further is, and we are right now already is developing these electrical systems further. This is something we are doing, mm -hmm. not the airframe itself, no. And some Slovenian museum? No, no, uh, we are looking at the Smithsonian or things like that. <laughs> <laughs> if the cosmos on this thing, you would build another one or? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I wouldn't, but uh, because I wouldn't, I mean, unless it's a test pilot, uh, I wouldn't uh, have anybody piloting this thing. I tried flying it for a bit, it's, it's okay, but it's not for a regular pilot. You are informed about this Slovenian project. Uh, I think its leader is Domingo uh, for the batteries. Uh, yeah, I mean, we are following, but. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, what we need is a reliable battery pack serially produced that has so many and so many cycles and uh, we are not a battery company, so what we are looking at is finished products really, so we are following the development, but we are not actively involved, but too, too few resources to, to be involved in such things. What is NASA planning to do with the concept? Whatever they desire, I mean, they have the right to actually purchase it if they want to. It's not a unique aircraft in this sense. I mean, there is the White Knight, which is carrying the spaceships, the commercial space flights. It's a similar concept, so it's not particularly new. But I mean, it's interesting from the point of view of low distribution centers. So maybe somebody will pick up on it. Uh, what about to put the sails on the, the surface? It would be. It's, it was allowed. Yeah. Uh, it would be possible, it was just too complex in the time frame for us to build a good enough surface with this and the gains would be minimal if at all. I mean, you gain some weight, yeah. but you don't gain quite a lot of power. I mean, uh, you, I mean, each square meter what you get, we have 300 watts in good conditions and then 22 square meters of surface area is not a lot compared to uh, total mean? power. Yeah. Who, uh, who has the initial idea to complete? Uh, you mean uh, to, to apply for this competition? Ah, uh, there were a few. There were uh, some American designs. Uh, no, no, in your company. Oh uh, no, uh, we competed in previous competitions, similar ones, but the which you did, where you could compete with regular aircraft, and they were just compared to, like our standard field software. And then when the competition was out, we knew that we wanted to be there immediately. So it was not even a question, really. It was just a question whether we would be able to pull off the design and until the same way we waited until all the components were available so that we could say, okay, the engine will be this, batteries will be that. And when we set the project finalized, then we proceed. What were the marketing effects after work? Very positive, really. Uh, it, it, this fell just in the part when the market was in a big slump also in the aviation industry, so then the sales really picked up after this. So. It's really helped a lot. And still, it's still being felt really. To put the name Pipister really in the US mar uh, a bit more, but where it was not present so much, and it's a big market, so that helped. Okay, <laughs> then I will continue with changes. Let's say a different project. I will not, this will be much uh, shorter, of course. I will not talk so much about this. Namely, because a lot of things that I presented for the G4 also holds true for the Pantera. Uh, it's a, still a composite aircraft, still a high efficiency machine using CRD tools to design the shapes and airfoils and etc. etc. What I will emphasize is really where it differs. What, what's different about designing a competition aircraft from designing a really market product? Uh, that you want to sell in there. First of all, the design is finalized uh, to a much greater extent before being committed to building uh, on a computer in the CAD design. So, what we really had is almost a completely finished design on the computer in CAD tools before uh, building the first component. So, not just the external shape which you require to build the molds and etc. for the composite parts, but really all the control linkages engine positioning, engine cooling, uh, under undercarriage design, uh, because it's a type of undercarriage, so it's quite a complex part of the aircraft. 
And this was all finalized before even committing to the first um, piece. And we used a lot of rapid prototyping techniques here uh, all along the project. So what you see on the left, we have an, our own uh, eight-axis milling machine, which is based on a robot arm. Uh, what you see here on the left is a block of styrofoam being milled uh, with the uh, internal cockpit uh, components of the aircraft to build a mock-up of the interior. What we did was build a mock-up of the interior just to test the ergonomy uh, of the aircraft. So you can see that all the structural things are already produced, designed. So the CAD model is not completed because it was changed later based on these tests, but we built the whole uh, ergonomic model and then we set it to test the different ideas where to, we need more room where we can go with less and put some components there, which is something you cannot do on a computer. That's, that's important. But you can do a lot on the computer, but not everything. So uh, this, was also, this was also a few lessons that we learned during the building of the, um, of the assembly phase of the aircraft, namely how you assemble the controls, how you can access with different tools, this is something that's very hard to do on a computer. Now some research is being performed how to do the uh, assembly, actual virtual assembly with the gloves, etc. But this is still high-end research, not really something pra practically applicable. So then you have to go and redesign some things once, because you figure out that the guys will simply not be able to build it if, the way you designed it. But still you try to do it beforehand, but the computer does not help you with it. And then a lot of care was taken. Here is the wing model being built, what we did was mirror the shape of the wing uh, from styrofoam, then we put uh, glass fiber on top uh, and then finish the surface cleanly. And then what we used was templates with airfoils every s using different stations to get the twist and the shape of the airfoils correct. This is such a delicate process that you cannot rely on the milled uh, parts to be really what you require because once you mill a piece then it can twist, it can bend. So what we did was just build it and then by hand check with the temp with templates each airfoil whether it has the right shape and the right twist so that the wing was then really a nice piece from which you can then build the molds for composite parts. So really a lot more care was taken then with the competition aircraft. Here you can see how the undercarriage, the main strut and the wheel and the shock absorber were designed on a computer completely before being built. So there is a main titanium gear and some aluminum parts. We are using actually just very simple Autodesk Inventor for this, but it's really well suited for mechanical design such as this. Uh, and then the leg is exactly the same shape as, of course, uh, design. And what was really nice was the guys never believed it in that were used. The technology guys uh, were used to old school designs and just testing. So when once we put this into the aircraft, the the whole system of a retractable undercarriage, which is really complex on this aircraft because no two axes are aligned and it's really some special mechanism, it just fitted perfectly. So that was quite an achievement. So, uh, especially from the point of view of the skeptical guys in the technology department. And of course, interior design is something we are focused on because this, in the last stage this year, we, this was mostly what we worked on. Uh, now this is really mostly about styling, not so much about functionality anymore, and now we are talking about styling here. And this is where a lot of emphasis was going towards. And we did work with an Italian designer, Massimiliano Pinucci, with whom we worked on many projects before, but none as complex as this one uh, so far. So what we wanted was to present a very professional looking environment, but still uh, in an automotive style more, so that people feel comfortable in it. Uh, so this was the blend that we were going for, really. Uh, High-end technical design of the dashboard, so that's why it's quite angular, but the parts which are made for comfort are really uh, much softer in design and more um, comfy in some sort of way. So this, there was a contrast between te technical parts and, let's say, human parts. So what you see here is two designers working on some lines on the cockpit cutout, so this was just a testing of this line and how it fits in the general three-dimensional design when you look at it from different points. So what we did was a mock-up of the dashboard, which is styrofoam block, exactly the same shape as the real dashboard, and then we did little design uh, iterations. Here is the real dashboard already in place now. There is two worried engineers uh, looking at whether we will ever finish this design in time for the Aero exhibition in April, which was in April this year. You can see some armor rests here already in place, etc. And this is the interior design now of 
the aircraft finished. So you can see leather seats, uh, armrests, uh, etc., etc. So, of course, when it's one, I mean, we were in a hurry, so we didn't really match the materials quite as nicely as we would like in some parts, let's say our colors, but. Uh, for the first iteration, it was really good because we built it in a couple of months, let's say, the whole interior. For example, this is, you can see this line of the dashboard here, twin uh, uh, color design in the leather wrapped and central controls, sticks, etc. So, in the end, it's, uh, it's a design I'm quite proud of and already a design where. Uh, we see a lot of room for improvement once you see it in place. This is still sort of not the final design, yet, but uh, as close as possible for the exhibition. But we were talking a lot about different aspects. Never forget that it's all in the team. So what you need for, to pull off a successful design is to have a team that shares the vision of the project. So whether you have engineers, whether you have marketing people, whether you have stylists, all the people have to have a really good idea about what, what the project is about, what are the aims of the project, and they have to embrace the aims of the project. It's not very good if people have different ideas about what this aircraft should represent, and everybody tries to push it in that direction, then, it, then you're lost. This is probably true about all design projects. So what you really need is a really good coherence of the team, so the people know what is to be achieved, and they embrace the idea. So they really, this is what we want, and this is what we will do. And I think with these two projects we were quite successful in achieving that. Uh, we will see, I mean, the Pantera still has to fly, hopefully it will be as painless as it was with the Taurus G4, but there are always nasty surprises in store, but yeah, we are hoping for the best. So, uh, I think with this I will conclude really the part of the presentation that we can rather discuss whether we have questions, etc., about the design process itself and uh, so on. A lot of questions were already asked, but... Uh, so you don't know yet if the Pantera flights? No, I mean, we don't know. Flights in the flies. computer, but... The yes, I mean, it will fly, of course. I mean, the flying part is not an issue. The flying good part is the issue. So whether it will be as fast as we expect it to be. I mean, what we are aiming for with this aircraft is to have... Um, just put it back on, on... What we are aiming for is to have 50% less power, so let's say two-thirds of the power of the competing aircraft using, having the same performance. So, if I show you this. The idea is, if you compare it to aircraft with similar interior room, I mean, the, the room interior was, uh, the benchmark was the Cirrus aircraft, so you could know it. Uh, we went with the same internal cockpit area. But what we did was just to put all the components as close together as possible and use the minimum uh, surface area around the components to achieve the design. So if you put this and the Cirrus one to each, next to each other, this one externally is very, very small. It looks like a really small aircraft, but it is also a lighter aircraft for this and a smaller aircraft, but the interior comfort is the same and the performance is the same. So this is what we are aiming for, really. Whether we are successful, we hope to be, but uh, if we are not, then we know how to proceed to improve the design. So that's the important thing. So flight evaluation will then tell us how to improve the design. But calculations say one thing, then we, will, we have design, we have analysis method to see what's wrong with the design if it doesn't work, as you saw the tufts testing, etc. What are the expectations I mean, in the setting? The speed, the range? Right. Uh, we, we are aiming for a cruise speed of 200 knots and 200 horsepower. Mm -hmm. uh, and the range is over 1,000 nautical miles, that's a nice number. So mm -hmm. this is really comparable to all the competition. However, what we are doing in the competition is not that we want to have this range with four passengers on board. Usually on most aircraft you have to sacrifice passengers for full range. But what we went is into a really lightweight construction so that the maximum takeoff mass of 1,200 kilos is really with four passengers, uh, full fuel, and uh, baggage. Uh, of course, there is then going to be an option of extra fuel tanks for extra long range, but for 1,000 nautical miles, you can do it with a full set of passengers on board plus luggage. So that's what differentiates us from really from the competition. At least we hope this will happen. And it will be first uh, navigation in the US? Or? Uh, the first one will be local here for the uh, 
for the experimental flying, of course, this is what we need to obtain to do the flight tests. Uh, but the first customer who will take, actually, we will deliver this prototype to him is Australian. So he wants to have the first aircraft. So after flight testing, he gets this one. Why do you use uh, T-tail? I mean, ah, I mean it's not uh, popular. I know it's in I know the names, but uh, I th the reason is really a company uh, company trademark, really, because uh, the reason is we have good experience with it uh, from handling an aerodynamic point of view. Uh, and I think the market acceptance is much bigger now because Diamond, uh, which is a big competitor of us, all of their designs are also detailed uh, and uh, the market acceptance right now is okay. It didn't used to be, mostly because of the Tomahawk accidents, etc. Uh, which I had a detail, but it was not the reason for the accidents. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really to keep it in line with uh, our usual designs. Plus, what we like about it is that the handling does not depend on the throttle setting. So. If you have the, uh, the elevator lower down, when you push the throttle, you have a lot of authority. But if on landing, if you decrease the throttle, you may lose authority altogether. It's a really bad idea. So we don't like it very much. Have you, have you ever considered the fly-by-wire system on this plane? Sure. I mean, this is something for the future. Uh, the problem with fly-by-wire systems is certification of the aircraft. Uh, there are certification procedures which are in place for light aircraft. And of course, you can do, go the fly-by-wire route, and we would be capable of doing it. We have uh, an engineer doing a PhD exactly in controls uh, of that sort. Uh, however, market acceptance is a problem, and uh, the other bigger problem is certification procedures, which for this sort of aircraft would have to be done anew. So when you go to EASA, which is the European agency for this sort of thing, you would have to think of a real procedure to test all of these things which is something you don't have to do with a more conservative design. You would have extra tests which would delay your certification and delay your time to bring the certified model to the market. Even right now, we didn't start the certification yet. Right now, we will send, sell the first aircraft as experimentals, which in the US is okay. Uh, however, the certification process right now for the, let's say, non-complex aircraft such as this, takes three years minimum. So each additional year then kills your market. I mean, what is good is that fly-by-wire will be added only, so when the market acceptance will also be better, and we will do it as a supplemental certificate in the end. But this is something the market will develop into, that's almost certain. What's the future of PPS3? I mean, like bigger planes in 20 years? Uh, Depends on where the market shifts will go, where the market demand is. Uh, probably bigger planes, of course, like six seats, but not really really big planes yet. Yeah. We will see. Uh, what we want, what we aim for is really efficient planes. And we were one of the pioneers in the market uh, where uh, efficient planes are uh, required. Um, efficiency was not such a big issue uh, before, but right now with composite materials you can really have huge gains in that. So Bert Rutan was the person who really demonstrated this in practice. And now we are trying to get this idea of efficiency to the market and continue with it. What we want also to be the first really producer of electric and hybrid aircraft, like uh, certified aircraft. And we want to bring these new propulsion systems to the market. So uh, this is one of the major goals, to be the first in this market, because then it's also easier to dictate the certification requirements, etc. Et so we are talking now, uh, together also with University of Maribor and Siemens and Rotax, to have a hybrid propulsion for, uh, for aircraft in this segment develop. Did you ever think about uh, one wing plane shape? Uh, without a fuselage? Or, uh, or without, one a without a tail? Yes. We, had some, we started such a design for Celex Galileo, is a company, uh, Italian company producing, well, mostly weapons. Uh, uh, but what they were interested in is um, unmanned vehicles, uh, so remote controlled vehicles, and we did a design study with them. Uh, Exactly, of a flying wing aeroplane. But it's really a compromise. Uh, a flying wing aeroplane theoretically has the advantage of not having extra control surfaces, extra drag, etc. But when you figure out what you have to sacrifice for it, namely you can have high lift systems on such an aircraft, it's very hard to get the correct lift distribution across the span, so induced drag uh, kills you. In the end, uh, the flying, the single wing aircraft are only sensible if you can have an unstable design where you have fly by wire designs then they become sensible again. Uh, otherwise, you have just too much uh, sacrifices in other areas that they are really not worth it. So, 
Th this is a this this is something to consider. I mean, all of the shapes are considered in every new design. We start from canard to flying wing to standard configuration. Then you evaluate the design from different viewpoints, and all the people give the comments what they think will happen. Some of them are, of course, just aesthetics, and some people just don't like the way it looks. But usually, it boils down to the fact that you simply cannot uh, achieve the performance goals with whichever shape. And the classical design is actually still by far the most uh, efficient one in this segment of aviation. Can you say a bit more about this large screen in the inside, in how it works? Uh, you mean the... The instrument by uh, the screen. On the interior. Yeah, yes. OK, we'll go to the actual pictures. It just takes a while. Okay. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, what we have is uh, Garmin 500 instruments on left and right duplicated. Mm -hmm. And then there is additional Garmin. I'm not an avion avionics guy, so I have no idea what it's called really. But there are different systems on the plane. So what you have is all the main instruments, such as altitude, speed, etc., are, mm -hmm. are replicated here or here, depends how you switch it, and engine control. So all the standard instruments that you have dials, etc., are replicated on these screens. Plus, you have additional features such as artificial view outside, with like Google Earth type, type of thing. Uh, but they really take mostly this into account. Plus, people like it, so, you know, big screens. So I don't know, but it's a marketing thing. What we do have is backup instruments at home. Mm -hmm. So, just if this fails, that you can still have backup for the main instruments, altitude, speed, etc. Yeah. But really, they replace the standard instruments, and some of them have then autopilots in them, etc. So. And it's using a lot of energy. Yeah, it is. You need to you need to size your generators for it. Uh, so that's quite a quite a drain. I mean, not in this aircraft. This is not such a problem. But on our standard uh, light sport aircraft, people really want huge displays. And then what we have is a real issue right now because we have two alternators on the motor, for example, <laughs> sometimes yeah. just because of that. So, but that's the market demands. You screen or you take off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or just the screen. Exactly. <laughs> what programs uh, do you use for, for designing? Ah, that's, that's a good one. Uh, for designing, first you use the CAN, then, uh, then you go to the computer. Uh, the, the, uh, what we use for surface design is mostly CATIA. But what we use for general sketching, for simple sketching, we simply start with Rhino. Uh, those of you who are familiar with it, uh, it's a simple enough program. But what's good about Rhino is that all of the surfaces we design there can be imported into other uh, CAD software, which is not true of, of most other uh, design software. So Rhino is mostly made for designers, but those surfaces can be directly used in CAD models. So. And for all these calculations, for air right. airflow, uh, this is, uh, for the airflow, uh, what we use is OpenFoam, which is an open source package for computational fluid dynamics. It was developed in, uh, I think, in Imperial College, but there is a guy from Zagreb in the end there as well. Uh, what we, um, I was the leader of the, of the whole project, and it's really good, so some of the Formula One teams I know use it as well, so, and it's free, so you can beat the price. It's a bit <laughs> difficult to use, though, so we have to program scripts instead of having nice models to rotate. Um, for structural analysis, we use Abacus. Um, but this is mostly what we use. And then we have some of our own codes to design uh, airfoils and propellers, which is what I do there, personally. And what says your uh, design and marketing department about uh, interior design? What are their vision? How or it could be how will be the market. In the future, I mean. Or yeah, in the next five years, maybe. Right. In the interior design, I mean, first of all, we have to bring it closer to the automotive interior design, which really is at the pinnacle right now. But then again, you cannot do it properly because uh, it's just too expensive. The, the amount of units sold simply does not uh, allow for techniques used in automotive industry. You know, modes for plastic parts are simply too expensive. It's cheaper to build carbon composite parts than it is to build molds for plastics, which is silly, you know. What we then do is look at the high-end automotive design interior where you can use leather, etc., to cover surfaces, which is what, uh, I mean, in cars this becomes expensive, but aircraft already are expensive, so then uh, that's easier to achieve. So it's really about interior comfort, uh, visibility, 
Um, ergonomics, that's important. This is what we studied quite a bit. So the seating positions, the cushioning, uh, a lot of aircraft get this wrong. Also positionings of controls. Uh, but what is also important in the aircraft is procedures. So how to position switches uh, that you have a nice flow. Uh, you take off, then you know that the switches you will have to do it over, let's say, from left to right. So that you don't hunt the dashboard, but when you take off, you don't, you don't have much time to think. It's, everything is happening quickly, so flaps, etc., etc., etc. You can go stage by stage in an order which is prescribed. And when on landing, you do the reverse, for example. So such workflow design is also very important, also in interior design for airplanes. So uh, and then of course automation. So right now you can see it because the engine technology is so ancient in this segment. This is the engine controls, the three levers. Uh, and you have separate controls for mixture, for throttle, and for propeller. So what, whether the development is going in, is in the direction of single lever control for throttle, so go faster, go slower, and just tweak three knobs and then check RPM and temperature, etc. So this has to be automated. So, but really, it's following what the uh, what the automotive industry is really doing. Just that it's a bit more complex, so there's more work to do. And also a fly-by-wire, which was a question. This is being introduced on Diamond. I know has a project. Not really fly-by-wire, but uh, assisted control. So you have still have mechanical linkages, but you have actuators which assist you for stability reasons, etc. So they work work together with you. I mean, already we have autopilot systems which are the same. Autopilot is just an electrical actuator connected to control rods, so that it can fly for you. But what Diamond is not doing, I know, is some research into augmenting the controls in a way that uh, make flying easier. This will also be something because you, not a lot of people can, not all the people can learn to fly. Let's say, right? so I mean, not all the people can learn to drive. But this is a compromise, except for this way. Basically, everybody can get a license, but with planes, it's a bit more dangerous. So but then you have to make flying easier. Here, if you're autopilot, you can see the stage uh, moving. Yeah, it's still moving, yeah. and okay. you can override it if you override it. Then Disconnects. What, what's the difference between experimental uh, planes and uh -huh. fully structured planes? Uh, technically, none. Uh, I mean, that is, from design point of view, there is no difference. It's exactly the same airplane. Uh, just the thing is that for certification reasons, you have to uh, prove certain demands from testing, from, from structures, handling, aerodynamics, etc. You have to just prove the, by the rule book that it fulfills certain criteria. Uh, I mean, in the experimental category, you can build crazy things, right? So, uh, but for this aircraft, there is absolutely no difference. It's just a matter that before you get the certificate, it's a way to sell the planes in a kit form. So you sell the components, and the people can assemble it themselves. That's the uh, that's really the way it works. Although the factory usually helps them. Uh, yeah, that's the standard procedure. Is there any limits for the pilots where they are allowed to do or not? Uh, not in the US, uh, but in the Europe, yes. So it's mostly for the U.S. market. But what people tend to do sometimes is just uh, register it in the U.S. and import it. So. How many planes of this motor are you expecting to sell? Right, I, uh, starting slowly, of course, with once the production ramps up, but we are hoping about 200 per year at least. We have to see if the production begins, but hopefully more, because the biggest players sell more than that. So we want to be one of the bigger players here. What's the price? The price is uh, 400,000 euro, more or less, but it's going up slightly now because we see that the market can handle it. This was the price for the, uh, at the Aero Exposition, where we showed it. Before it produced in Italy? Yes, the, the, the first few ones experimented were in Slovenia, but the serial production were started in Italy. Uh, what about the quality and recycling of all materials? You said you use uh, the epoxy, mm -hmm. uh, and the epoxy is known not as recyclable materials. What about this? There is this aspect, yes. Uh, it's unfortunately you cannot do much about it. I mean, you can recycle, of course, aluminum planes, uh, but uh, that's just the fact of life. This is not something that we really like, but the, the problem is also even worse that the modern epoxy components. Uh, are much more environmentally friendly than the old ones. However, when you are building a certified aircraft, you have to also use certified materials. 
and then you are forced to use materials which are not ideal from any point of view uh, just because certification demands it or you can certify your own material but then the resources are huge to do this so you just cannot afford it really. There is the economic reality. So. Yeah. So when can we expect like an iPhone box or something? Uh, there is no. <laughs> there is a. You said it's going closer to the uh, automotive market. It, uh, it doesn't have the iPhone dock. It has an iPad pocket because uh, all the maps are uh, seriously pilots. Uh, iPad is a certified uh, flight instrument for maps, etc. So a lot of pilots use it for maps. So that instead of having a bunch of maps, you just have the iPad and then you take it out and check. It. So it has an iPad pocket. <laughs> Do you think that the company will grow? Like, I don't know where it is now, but... Yeah, I mean, certainly with this project, yes. Uh, right now we have 70 people employed. Uh, what we expect is to have a, about 100 people initially at least, and then more uh, working on the Pantera. So we expect to grow, but not immediately, but as the production ramps up. So yeah, this, this is where the growth should lie in this moment. Um, maybe you had any ideas to, let's say, your, your company is like a trend seller in, in the aircraft uh, industry because with uh, low weight and with uh, electric uh, propulsion, uh, maybe do you thought of going into the automotive industry like a new revolutionary car or something like that? Of course, I mean, these are ideas we toy with. We just uh, right now don't have the resources to enter this because this is taking most of our time, really. Uh, it's an idea we toy with, but not really serious, you know. We don't have ideas how to improve car designs, just no resources to actually do it. How are you handling your publication? Because, before you said, uh, it's, the team is important. Mm -hmm. Do you have anybody that uh, handles this, or you know, uh, as you're a small team, you can do it alone? Or? It's really about getting along and having uh, the right people in place really that are capable of working in teams. So I would handle really the communication mostly. So that you would have, let's say, project leaders which handle the technical aspects, etc., or then the project leaders themselves do the focus thing. What I need to do usually is just kind of conflicts, etc. Where they, they do occur, of course. You just have to realize where they're coming from and that they are not really personal, but you just have to make sure that they don't become personal conflicts, that's the important thing, because they're usually technical, etc. So we have to identify that and uh, handle it as a technical issue, not as a personal issue. So do you have like daily meetings or by email or how uh, do you work? We have a regular weekly meeting of the, the, the design department. Uh, and then the rest is really, we really go around and check on how the designs are progressing individually, but there is a weekly meeting really of reviewing where the, all the projects stand. Uh, but each project then has its own individual meetings by need, typically. Do you have any internship programs? Programs as such, no. Uh, we do accept interns from time to time. I mean, it's a drain on the resources, not so much financial, but really about handling the students, etc. But we do take good applications sometimes, yes. But maybe one, maybe two per year, something like that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>